Can I use that one? Yep. All right, Kevin. Can I have the mic? Oh, didn't have one down there? No, sir. Oh, he was unprepared. Yes, he was. All right, you can be seated. Thank you, sir. All right, there we go. All right, I'm glad to be with you. I've missed a few weeks. I know Brother Pip has filled in admirably. He, I understand that he was at 37 minutes last week, 37 minutes, and that is um, heroic. heroic. It's a shame he went that short. Now I have to, like, get it, keep it short. But um, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. Help us to use it to our own advantage. In Christ's name, amen. All right, these are things you've already got. Hopefully you, um, I, um, I, I like conformity, so let me do this. Um, I can even get fancy and go A, B, C, I like that. Since nobody here takes notes, but very few of you take notes, I promise you, you will forget this. And that's why week after week after week, we've been going back and covering the same uh, ground. It's not like we just keep plowing the same, you know, same old mule, same old furrow and keep plowing. It's no repetition is the key to learning. And since the mind is like, that's the nerve center that controls everything. If your mind is warped or your mind is troubled or your mind is polluted or your mind is weak, um, then, you're, then you're going to make decisions more with your body, which is your flesh, which injures your soul, which won't let the spirit work. In fact, Jesus said, what is the profit of man if he gain the whole world but loses on what? So, so, so now we all think that means um, lost man. Maybe in this case, Luke 15, but when you lose your soul, what else do you lose? Automatically lose. What to automatically lose when you lose your soul? There's only two other choices there. So you lose your spirit. Now, do you lose your salvation? Of course not. No, you don't ever lose your salvation. But when you don't control your mind, which is in your, controls your soul, then your spirit never really does. Somebody's always grouchy. Somebody's always in a bad mood. Somebody's always irritable. Somebody's always <clears throat> wake up grouchy in the morning. No, I just let her. <laughs> Jack doesn't wake up grouchy. She's, uh, she's pretty good. Well, actually, I can't lie. Uh, it's kind of hard to wake up. In fact, I like going outside. I like working in the yard. We got some lights on. Four or five o'clock in the morning, I wake up. I'll be out there. My hands are like frozen. And I come in, and she's under. Me, I just like, hey, give me a quilt. I mean, even if it's cold, and once I get warm, um, she's under a quilt, this big heavy comforter, and all this, like, 14 pillows all set up. And then I'll go in there for quiet. Carol to the floor and creek, and I'll slide my hands under the covers. And before you know it, my ice cold hands are on her back and her leg, and she's screaming, ah! and then I get mad and say, Shut up. No, that's, that's not quite what happened. But uh, you lose your spirit. You lose your ability to let the spirit flow through you. You lose your ability to let, and if the spirit doesn't work in a Christian, man, what point is it? I mean, if the spirit doesn't work in a Christian, what point is it? So you've got to control. You can't control. In fact, somebody quote me 2 Corinthians 10 5. Mrs. White, 2 Corinthians 10 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thought. Stop. Which thoughts? Every. every. Yeah, you're high. <laughs> high. Oh, man. Every thought. Can't possible. Can't do it. So it's already like, why go up the plate? Why go up there against, you know, Sandy Koufax or uh, whoever, you know, uh, you know, whoever the great pitchers are of the past? Why, Justin Verlander, why go up there if you know you're going to strike out? Because you, cause you got a bat and you're on the team, get your rear end up the plate. And if you strike out, strike out swinging, play, fight, try. So when the Bible says casting down imaginations in every high thought, it's impossible but bless God, well, I don't put it that way. 
It would be better to say, well, I had 100 bad thoughts a day and I cast down 20 of them. Then I had 100 bad thoughts and I cast down two, and that was on accident. <laughs> I mean, there has to be an effort, agreed? Yeah. Uh, Emmett and Emma, clean up your room. Right. Um, Drew, help them clean up the room. Double right. Um, they're not going to do, but you want to pick up the toys, help mommy pick up the toys. Why? They're learning, they're growing. That's what we do with children. That's what we do in anything we start out. We begin. So, so Mrs. White, go ahead again, cast down imaginations in every high thought. Forth his fruit in his season, his leaves shall. <laughs> Casting down imaginations every high thought. That exalteth. That exalteth self against knowledge of God and bring you to, into captivity every Oh, there's that word the guy said I wouldn't interrupt you. <laughs> oh, why the Holy Spirit keeps that? Every thought, every imagination, every word. I, now, I never would ever, ever, ever say this, but there's times I feel like saying, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to say. I was going to get off my back, okay? I can't do it. Why do I even try? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are true? What sort of things are just? What sort of what things are wonderful? What sort of things are holy? What sort of things are... So it's like, whoa! Now, I'm not making fun of Scripture. Anybody done that this week? Has anybody... Your mind has been on what sort of things are true, honest, just, lovely... Virtue, praise, good report, pure. pure, Kev, some. right, 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 some, and we would all say some, some we have, so we've got here, we've got some, I mean, that's, that's where I want to go with this, that's where we're going to go, some, I mean, we need to get off this, the, the, uh, the mind here pretty soon, but some, which leads us to, what's this verse right here? Dr. Heron always used to say she loved it one of her thou shalt perfect, mature peace, because his mind, and it does, you know, it doesn't say her mind, because one can never keep her mind on. His, his keepeth his mind. What do you keep your mind on? What do we keep our minds on? When we battle. The battle is for the mind. Satan wants your mind. Satan wants my mind. I have a besetting sin. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, but it's something I just really, I mean, I'm pretty much, you know, I guess I think I am with my own sin life, I guess. Um, I've had something I've struggled with my whole, it's not anger or temper. That's beside the point. Don't bring that up. It makes me mad. <laughs> um, but we all have a besetting sin, okay? Now, I may be able to get over the huge sins, whatever those are. But if I have a besetting sin, in fact, take your Bibles and look there, Hebrews chapter 12. We'll use our Bibles tonight. Hebrews 12, I think it's uh, Hebrews 12, what, 1 and 2? Hmm, yeah. Every way... Uh, chapter 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews. Or here, this all leads to Hebrews. I need to get a new crowd, then I can say things like, this means that the man is supposed to make some coffee because he brews. Uh, yeah, you guys, you know, you don't care. Okay, Hebrews 12, 1. What's the Bible say? Wherefore, seeing we also, and this is Paul speaking, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, heaven's grandstand, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience race set before us. Okay, now look at that where it says uh, the sin, the sin which does so easily beset us. Does anybody here think, and I, I want your feedback here, does anybody think that's just one sin? The sin, no, the sin, which does so easily beset us. Now, you would think, by the way, that phraseology is there, that English said, the sin besets us. So it's the sin singular besets us, plural. So all of us, plural, 
are all beset with the same the sin. The same things in um, the book of uh, Revelation. What is it where it says, um, you have left your first love. Um, Jesus said, you've left your first love and you're lukewarm and I'll spew you out of the mouth. Well, some people say leaving the first love is um, soul winning. And I know a lot of Brother Dwayne White one loves souls. I don't think he, or, or love God. I'm sure of that. Love me, love church, love people, love, love kids. But I don't know if he ever one-on-one -on -one shared the gospel with somebody and took them from lost to bow their head and pray. I don't know if he ever did that. He told me he couldn't do it. He told me I don't have, he told me when he first started coming here and first started, uh, we were in this building, I'm pretty sure, it might have been on Clinton. He told me that if I, he said he can't pray in public. He doesn't want to be asked to talk in public. He gets nervous in public. Um, he said, um, if you ever ask me to pray in public, he said, I, I won't be able to do it. I'll be embarrassed. I can't do it. He said, I'll probably leave the church. Now, it wasn't a threat. If you call me to pray, I'll leave the church. It was more like, preacher, please, please. Because at that time, I used to call on different guys. And I'd have them come up and pray. We'd pray for the offer. He said, don't ever. Now, so I have someone against you. You left your first love. I don't believe it. I don't believe it means soul winning is the first love. I mean, how many of you think that? If you think that, you can raise your hand. If you think leaving your first love is leaving soul winning, I mean, I've heard it preached, I've heard it taught, I've heard people that, um, uh, teachers that I uh, uh, not revere, but esteem, and people that I value, I've heard it in sermons. But I don't believe leaving your first love is leaving soul winning. Just like I don't believe here that you say, well, what is it? Well, we're not talking about Revelation 2 right now. We're talking about Revelation 12 or Hebrews 12. It says, <coughs> the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience to race set before us. Okay. Now, so that tells me right there that us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, who here would be so um, foolish? if you put some thinking into it, that would say, we all have the same race to run in our life. The time we, like Jake says, from the time you're born to the time you die, that dash in the middle, everybody runs the same race. Would we all agree to that? No, we wouldn't agree to that because of course we don't all run the same day, a race. And if we put 500 people from Jake and uh, uh, Brother Jake and uh, Brother Drew's work in the same room, and they all heard a gospel message, and they all 500 got saved, including Drew and Jake. But if they all 500 got saved, they would all have a different race to run, though they would all be headed to the same place, true or false? Because sure. everybody's got different experiences, different, everybody's different. So it can't mean the besetting sin is for all of us. It doesn't, can't mean that. So that means I have a besetting sin. Um, um, that I need to lay aside, for that matter, I need to lay aside every weight and the sin which thus will be easily beset me. Boy, what could that be? Everybody's curious now. But I don't want to know yours, and, I, and you don't need to know mine. Only an individual knows, their, unless they are so close to someone, intimate with someone, they can share it, or they need help with it, or whatever. But a besetting sin is something that over and over and over and over, you trip and fall. Now, what could be a besetting sin? Anybody? I got notes here, but I want to get your thinking on this. Come on. We only got 20 minutes, 22 minutes. Drinking. Drinking could be a besetting sin. Yeah, sure. All right, drinking. Somebody else? Smoking. Smoking. Smoking what? <laughs> Anything. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, smoking. Okay. Uh, uh, um. Vaping. What would you say? Lazing? Vaping. Oh, that's probably bad for you. It probably does stuff to your lungs or whatever. Yeah, it probably harms the temple, so to speak. What about this? <laughs> okay, so smoking, drinking. Lying. Cussing. Cussing. Yeah, that's what a besetting sin is. Um, smoking is not a besetting sin. Anybody in this room that I know of, 
drinking is not a besetting sin to anybody in this room that, besides Dr. Pauly that I know of. <laughs> um, fist fighting, we sing, well, how, how's that song go, Jake? Uh, drinking. Smoking, drinking. Smoking, drinking. How's it go? Fist fighting, dirty talk. They all make you walk the dirty. Okay, nobody here. There's a brawler. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, I, hey, look, you know what? I was thinking about this. I, people that say, oh, he's a brawler. No, I just believe in, I believe in when there's going to be a situation, just get there with the most, the fastest, the meanest, and that's what somebody, oh, he's a brawler, he's got a bad temper. No, I just don't, I don't believe in this. You're a one, I'm a two, you're a three, I'm a four, you're a five. You're, and escalate, escalate, escalate. No, it's like, hey, get it settled now. If you want some? If you want some, come and get some. If you don't, I'm going to come and give you some. Or you shut your mouth. Now, that's not a brawler. That's just the person who takes matters in hands when he has to. I can tell you story after standing in a White Castle on the way home from work. We're second went to school at 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and there's a, uh, the, the, the old school White Castle, and there's two, three people in line. There's a cigarette machine, and there's an aisle. Doors come through, and there's a guy, a small little guy, Ingleside. He's, he's, he's standing there waiting for his food. And a couple guys come in, two, three guys. There were two guys, and they tried to get in front of this guy. And when this little guy said, hey, you know, because there was an aisle, so he got right in. I said, hey, we're in, he said, I'm in line here. And the guy turned around and cursed this little guy, basically, and said, you know, shut up. It's like, man, I'm born for stuff like that. And so right away, I said, hey, and I, I'm not quiet. Hey, I said, you got in front of him, you got in front of me too, so move. And they gave me some cups. So I took my glasses off. There was a cigarette machine. Look, when you do that, somebody's like, off come the glasses and they're glaring. It's like, okay, red, better back up here. So he said, oh, I'm going to go out that door. I got some buddies. We're going to wait out, wait outside for you. I'm like, oh, please, you're making my day. So I told him, good. I'm going out that door right there. There was a long door. I said, I'm going out that door just a few minutes. So go away. I knew what I was buying. I had to get up. I had to stay up and study. It was one, two o'clock in the morning. Hot coffee, white castle, loosen the lid. Boy, if you come up on me, you're gonna you're, get splash mountain, baby. <laughs> and they were gone. Two of them, maybe another one, three, maybe three. Why didn't they say there's two of us and one of him? You know, I'm normal size, they were normal size. Oh. I just believe in when you do that. You get control of things. I've done it many, many times, many situations. It's not being a brawler. Now, I know I have a temper. It's not explosive, but it's there. But that's not my besetting sin. So alcohol is not everybody's sin. Uh, tobacco is not everybody's sin. Smoking dope is not everybody's sin. Um, cussing is not everybody's sin. Um, anybody here lazy? Would you rather sit or work? Um, I'd rather sit and watch Drew and Jake work. <laughs> I mean, everybody has a besetting sin. Maybe your besetting sin is, um, you know, maybe you look in the mirror and think you're ugly. And most of us were old enough to be past that stage. That's, that's a, I know Drew put his hands around Alicia. <laughs> it's all right, sweetheart. <laughs> all women say that. I'm so ugly. Like, no, you're not. Put all that makeup on, honey, and you'll be all right. We all have something. You know, I had a sin for a long time. I think it's a sin. Uh, we call it this compl inferiority complex. Because I used to think, I never thought everybody was better than me. I just thought, or I, I never thought I was behind everybody or worse. I just thought people were better than I was. Just had nicer homes, nicer parents, better clothes, better stuff. Ahead of me, and it wasn't until I really got in my mid twenties, till I started coming out of that. Started so till I started saying to myself, and I knew who I was, and all my life I lived. And I started, and I was at Hiles Anderson, a bunch of Christians there, and everything, and uh, people that have grown up in church. There was a whole lot to compare yourself to. 
But the Bible says comparing ourselves to other people were not wise, so I couldn't compare myself and just put my head down and did my best and did my best and did my best. And before you know it, at the end of my time, and it wasn't just at the end of the seven years, but about third or fourth year, I started uh, hitting my stride with work and and preaching and the bus ministry. And I guarantee you, and by the time I left, I was I was known uh, and had preached in, in chapel. By the time I left, I promise there were people at the school who compared themselves to me and felt inferior. Why? Because an inferiority complex, I think it's some kind of childhood thing that happens to us, it stays with us for a long time until you lick it. There may be problems from your life that you, you got to lick them. Why? Because the mind. How you think. As a man thinketh in his own heart, what is he? So is he. He is what he thinks. And your soul, Jesus said, if you lose your own soul, it's probably man against everything in the world, gain the whole world. But loses his who he is. Loses his soul, man. Loses the freedom to think. Jake mentioned him, referenced him on Sunday morning. Richard Wormbrand, he was a Romanian uh, pastor. He's a Lutheran pastor who's got more, uh, more Christianity than 99 out of 100 Baptists that I know. And he was tortured. He wrote a book called Torture for Christ. He wrote a book called, um, I got it from Honor Owen, or I don't know what her last name is now, but Honor Owen, and uh, it was called, um, If Christ Were Your Cellmate, Would You Give Me Your Blanket? They told a story about how someday somebody got a, um, like 15 men in four-man cells, 20 guys in four-man cells, a bucket in the corner um, for your necessities. Um, uh, and somebody got some sugar cubes. They smuggled in two sugar cubes. And every, the guy that had them uh, gave them to the guy next to him. And the guy held them for a while, held them for a while. And I don't mean a minute, but by the time a year was up, by the time the next Christmas was up, th those two sugar cubes came back to the first person. Not one person used them. Not one person ate them. Not one person. They all wanted to. They all would have been uh, uh, dying for it. Their body would be screaming for it. And yet, because they can, in their, in their soul, their mind, they yield to the spirit, which allowed them to control the body, and they didn't do a whole lot of stuff that they shouldn't have done. There's a lot of guys, women, people in prison that are Christians. And, and they, maybe they, they never learned this. Maybe they never heard it. Maybe they're in some kind of classes that in the prison. They're trying to teach them some kind of a whatever. But if they're Christians, they need to learn these truths, the mind, body, soul, spirit, these scriptures, um, which lead us, that's how keeping the perfect peace of mind state on thee, because we have to fight the body with the soul through the spirit, and there's a besetting sin. Now, if I have a besetting sin and I have weights, and I say to um, Angel and uh, Arif and, and Joe, I would say, okay, guys, um, I've been practicing and I have been uh, uh, training, and I've been eating my Wheaties, and we're going to get out in the parking lot on Sunday after church, and we're going to have a race. We're going to run from this side to the other parking lot and back. So they all show up. They're all limbered up, you know. Renee's got Joe's track suit out there, and the reef, he's ready to run, and Angel, he's talking about how he used to be a great soccer player. He's going to beat us all. And, and I show up, and everybody thinks, well, man, preacher's going to win. He's naturally, you know. Of course he's going to win. You know, he's plucked out playing basketball all those years. He, you know, he thinks he's an athlete. So I show up, and I have on my uh, big, heavy work boot, Timberland work boots, and I got my uh, heavy quilted jeans on to keep me uh, warm when it's cold out, and I have a, 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 a quilted a T-shirt and a quilt. I like to wear stuff over layers, you know, and I have a sweatshirt on. I have my overcoat on, and I'm wearing um, uh, 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 gloves, and I have on um, uh, uh, earmuffs. You say, what's all the gear about? Why well, is it how I run? It's wintertime, it's how I run. Now, is it wrong to wear boots in a foot race? Is it wrong to wear boots in a foot race, yes or no? No. no. Is it wrong to wear uh, extra clothing in a, in a foot race? No. Is it wrong with wearing an overcoat in a foot race, yes or no? No. What would those things be? Weights. Weights. Now, the last side of the thing to slow you down. 
got to lay aside. And it all starts with the mind. All right, now let's, get, let's use some Bible here. Body, soul, spirit. I lost my, no, okay, look, look up this verse. Uh, Philippians 5.19. Not Philippians, Ephesians. Ephesians. And, I, and these words here are just, um, they're killer, man. One little word. That's one reason you don't mess with the King James Bible. Because one word. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we already know, remember this, we already know from Romans 7, uh, 25, uh, that says, uh, let's see, 7, let me find it. That says this, uh, we read the whole chapter in Romans 7, and we find that Paul says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, that's the body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, so Paul's saying, I, I try, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but there's a, there's a war in my mind. And this war in my mind gets, gets me to do bad things. This war in my mind causes me to commit sins that I should. This war in my mind gets me to say things that impulsively or say things angrily or say things that I shouldn't say. This war of my mind causes me to oversleep or causes me to get angry, causes me to be impatient with my friends or my family or rude, whatever it is. And I'm being real basic. I mean, I, we could preach the, you know, skin off a rattlesnake about sin. But the things I'm talking about are the kind of sins that so easily beset the Christian. I'm talking about the world beset the Christian, all right? Ephesians 5. 19 says this, um, 518, and be not drunk with wine where is in excess, be filled with the Spirit. So how can you be filled with the Spirit? If you get filled with the Spirit, that takes care of everything right here. All these, all these things start happening when you're yielded to the Spirit and you got peace and you know it. You know when you feel good about things. And if you go back and look and go, you know, I was thinking about some good things. You come to church. We sing, uh, on Jordan's, uh, Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's, uh, Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. And then as we sing, if you think about the words, your heart starts to get in tune away from the, the things of the mind, away from the body and into the spirit. Now look, what's, so be not drunk with wine, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Sing. Speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then spiritual songs. What were some of those that we learned? Just a lot of review. Spiritual songs. Anybody remember uh, Psalm 25? Psalm 48? Anybody know those? Know the songs? Anybody remember that? Psalm 25, Psalm 48. I don't want to sing, man, because I can't, I can't pronounce my F's right or my PH's. I'm trying to not say phone. I'm trying to say the receiver <laughs> instead of the phone. Come on, Psalm. Come on. We, I taught you those songs. I taught them to keep in school. Start us off anywhere. Unto thee, o Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. What's your part? Here, I'll do my part. You do your part. Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Everybody, look, you can remember. Unto thee, O Lord. Now, I know you're not great. And you say, well, I don't want to sing out loud. Okay, what's the scripture say? Look at it again before I come back and slap all of you. What's it say? It says, speaking to yourselves, making melody in your heart. So if you don't sing out loud, that's okay. No, I don't sing. I don't sing very loud. The place was full. Nobody could hear me. I could sing. Then sing yourself. Sing to yourself. Speak to yourself. Sing to yourself. Speak songs and hymns to yourself. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. And there's nobody here. Anybody here ever heard somebody sing and they were so off key? It's like. Anybody know anybody like that? Me. You are? Kirsten is. Who else? You, Miss Kathy? You, Miss White? Are you, Miss Carrie? Are you a Reese? I'm so glad they can't squall as when I start singing. 
So what do we do? Now, here, here's what it's like. When you sing in your heart, is it mel melodious or does it sound all up and down and scratchy? I already know the answer. So the answer is, when I sing in my heart, it, is, it sounds right. Yes or no? When a person sings in their heart, the melody that they make. So you're not singing for me. Kev's not singing for me. Kev's not singing for me. Jake's not singing for me. You're not singing for anybody else. Not you're not singing to me or for me. You're singing to him. And you're not singing to him so he can hear you sing. He can hear you sing. Of course, Kevin's head's over here. Songbooks and let's sing, and, and you like singing, singing. But the idea of singing is not just on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, or 11 15, or whatever, and Sunday night. The idea of singing is all the time to fill your mind and heart and soul with the things of God in your spirit, which help you get control of, keep control of your mind, which leads you. You don't even got to keep control. When you do verse 519, I'm telling you, when you do 519, it makes this work with this, puts a hitch nail on this, and gives you these things right here. Then you go to the next step. Okay, now I want to figure out my besetting sin. I want to get rid of it. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's, maybe you overeat. Anybody here overeat? Tell the truth. Don't lie. Now here's what we'd all say. We would all look, no offense, Kev. We'd all look, Kev, he must overeat. I bet he doesn't eat more food than I eat. Or Drew. Why? Well, I bet I bet you 50 bucks he's got a slow metabolism. And I've seen Kevin eat. He doesn't go like this. I mean, Kathy does, but he he <laughs> And she can't sing and she... I'm leaving early. Um, you sing to make a melody in your heart. So I overeat. Now be honest. Do you overeat? Who overeats? Will you overeat? I just did tonight. You did. I bet you did. Depends on how good the food is. Yeah, I was telling. I was trying to stand up tall. There, I was like, let me stand up tall so I don't look so fat. And I kept going. <laughs> Saw pictures of myself. I'm like, damn, I really look like that. But Jack's like, well, you eat three or four candy bars every night. Man, I am like chocolate. So ice cream, man, alive. Okay, so we all have one. Now what, now don't answer it. Take a few seconds and ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, if we mean business tonight, it's still like 20 till or so. Um, is there a besetting sin I don't know about? Is there something that keeps knocking me down? Here's what we always say. Get this out of your brain. I want you to take your brain, unscrew your ear, that all fall out. So when you read your Bible, pray, tithe, come to church. Okay. Got it. We got it, man. Now, now that's beginners. Where do you go? Well, that's not really beginner. That's growth. That's all growth. But you go to what? Besetting sin. You go to what? Bringing captivity to every thought to the obedience of Christ. We go to um, uh, uh, bringing uh, my body. I die daily. So when I want to have that third healthy, Miss Jackson went and bought chili for me uh, from Wendy. And I love me some chili. I love me some red pottage. I've been like, Jake Esau wouldn't eat that red chili. Um, and she had all these crackers. I didn't want all the crackers. But she had this hot sauce. And I thought, well, I'll try it, you know. So I took, if you get one little carton of chili, I get the big family size. So I can just get one little carton, you know, it just flop right into a cereal bowl, you know. So I said, well, I'll put some hot sauce in there. And I, I like hot sauce. So I put two in there. It wasn't that it was that hot to the taste buds. But what it did to my insides is not even to be discussed. <laughs> and, I, and, it, and, the, and really, it almost like the Lord said, oh, read, man. And not only that, I probably eat, you know what a sleeve is, like a sleeve of cookies? I eat at least a sleeve of Ritz crackers. And Miss Jack takes a half a pound of sharp cheese, whoosh, 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 slices it, and man, I just... I take the cheese, I tear it a little bit, I drop it in the chili and stir it around. And then by the time it's done, it's like, man, I would pay 50 bucks for this stuff right here. It's delicious. But that's the problem. It's so good. It's so good, I just want to eat more. In fact, I have, like, some at home. I can't wait to get there. Eat some at night. Miss Jack said, I made tuna fish for supper. Oh, really? You know what? I know you 
so you can eat it, you know, with a spoon. Uh, open up, there's a big old thing here. Take it out, get out a cereal bowl again. <laughs> Ladle it in, fill up a cereal bowl full of the overeating is what I'm talking about. We all do it, don't we? So we all have things that, well, I don't overeat. That's not my thing. Well, what is your thing? Are you depressed? Are you, are you a complainer? Are you grumbly? Are you not like people? Every time you meet somebody, you grouch with somebody. Like my kids don't even like to go with me places because everywhere I go, it's like, I don't know. I, I don't believe in this, like I'm like um, P.T. Barnum. I've never been a stranger. But um, man, there are people everywhere. You never know. You never know who you're talking to. And the Bible says, again, let's get back to the Bible. Some have entertained angels unawares. Uh, Miss Jack and I were at a restaurant not long ago. Two big boys. I mean, they were from, um, they played football at St. Francis. And they were big boys. I mean, one was like maybe basketball players, but one was like six, four, five, probably 280, big dude. And when we walked out, we were at Panera Bread, I think. And we walked out. Here's two of them coming in, Miss Jack and I coming out. I walked right in the big one and gave him a forearm shiver. Now, I didn't really give him a shiver shiver. But I bumped him. I said, man, I hate guys like you. Right away, they got it. Here's this little, this is not little, 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 little old dude saying, and surely they thought, he don't want none. I know he don't want none. <laughs> and I told him, I said, man, how big are you? Right away, it was like old friends. And I said, man, I hate guys like you. I said, I play ball my life, lift the weights, and blah, blah. We talked about 15 seconds. But there's just two guys that ran into this Christian, made him feel better. Why? Because my soul's in good shape. At least it was that day. Which allowed my spirit to operate. Now, if I'd been thinking about it, or Miss Jackson had been, she'd have gave him a track. Well, that was funny. I wish you'd have heard it. But I should have. But we didn't. What am I saying? I'm saying everywhere you ought to go, man, if you're under control. And not, not everybody talks like me and is, is a, a verbal as me. has been around as much as me. But, but you want to be open-spirited. You want to be able to keep your spirit, your soul strong, keeps your body to be quiet and quit winning every battle you have, which allows the spirit to work through you. And when you let the spirit have control... You dwell on these subjects what's there, things are pure. Okay, Miss Alicia was telling us about, um, you know where I got this? I can't believe I pulled this out of his pocket. That's Brother White. You gave it to me. I asked Miss White to give me one thing to Brother White. I, I was hoping it would be like a car or a tool, <laughs> riding a little mower, backhoe, you know, bobcat. Here's what she gave me. Amen. It was so thoughtful. <laughs> I'm teasing. Every time, I, every time I preach, I always carried it. I always wear a watch for my dad. I never wear it any other time except when I preach or come to church. And uh, then this hanky that he gave me. I used to leave it up there anyway. So, so when we do these things, that gives us perfect peace, man. And when you've got perfect peace, it's like, hey, we're going on vacation. Fun, fun, fun. Hey, we've got to pay the bills today. Fun, fun, fun. Hey, we get to go grocery shopping. Fun, fun, fun. We don't live in Africa where they got to you know, go on line to eat or whatever they do. Hey, we got fresh, we got running water. Are we out of water again? No, turn on the tap. Oh, that's dirty water. Well, it beats what they drink in Africa or a lot of India or a lot of other places in the world. So be thankful. Be thankful. We're going to look at a verse in Colossians, but it says, be thankful for everything. Everything? Goodness gracious. When we, you say, how can I do that? Right here and right here. Then I got a lousy childhood. I got ripped off. I got brothers and sisters feel that way. Grand, and I have uh, uh, nieces and nephews. Uh, some on, well, got two or three siblings that their children feel that way. Oh, I got a crummy mom. I got a crummy dad. Well, you should have been my, my dad. Now, my dad was a good guy and all that, but you should have had my home, uh, 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 niece and nephew. My brothers and sisters had the same home or better than I had my sister Cindy, my sister, my brother Andy, and myself. We were the three middle. We all I was the middle kid, right? Dead in the middle. Two older brothers, older sister, two younger brothers, younger sister. I was dead in the middle. And for what I fell on the cusp of, you know, whatever. And it was always me going off with dad, my little brother, little sister, and my dad, who had been the oldest in his family. His dad was 19. My grandfather was 19 when he married my grandma, 13. 
in Silicon, Alabama, and they came north to Detroit. My dad was the firstborn son, born in 27, in Detroit, which means they grew up during the Depression and uh, early World War II. He had four younger brothers and sisters, and I guarantee you back then, you could beat your kid, beat your kid, beat your wife, and cops didn't do anything. So that's in Detroit. And, and my, my, my grandfather was a heavy drinker, all the family was. So my dad was the oldest, always put in charge of his little brother. My dad was ferocious. I mean, my dad was like, he did not, he's one of the most, not courageous, but fearless. Just sometimes like, whoa, dad. I was always amazed when he did something like, against somebody or stood up for something. But um, it was ingrained in him. Why? He was the oldest, four brothers, younger brothers, sisters. I promise his mom and dad said, Watch out for little brothers and sisters. So my dad, the oldest, grew up taking care of little brothers and sisters. I grew up taking care of my little brother and sister. I can complain. I can whine. I can cry like a baby like I got some other siblings to do. Oh, our childhood. Oh, our parents. Oh, our. How about this? I have a Bible. They have a Bible. I prefer to read mine. I, tr I try and do this, which gives me this. And I thank my God every day. Not every day. I thank God for my parents. For my childhood, for my teenage years, for all the mistakes, for all the things I learned, for all the, the um, uh, um, uh, blessings he gave me. Uh, so, you know, I guess it all depends on how you look at it. No, it's not at all depending on how you look at it. It's all depends on how you think about it. Amen. The mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. All right, so you got uh, Philippians 5. You got all these things here. Music, hymns, songs. You got Bible memory, Psalm 119, verse 911. You have, um, look at all the things going on now. All these uh, schisms, uh, phobias, um, chemical imbalance, um, bipolar, uh, ADHD, ADD, panic attacks. Um, I wrote this down. I don't know. Talk back to me. Foods, medicines? I mean, I, I have it written down in my notes. Foods, question mark, medicines? I wrote down, and I'm from Indianapolis. I wrote down Eli Lilly. That's a big one down there, man. West Side. Pharmaceuticals. Man, what's in the drugs we take? <laughs> Who knows? It was approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Oh, it's another government office for your sport. Like, like, and, and I don't even give a rip about this. There was a big, uh, not a big thing, but my family, they're a bunch of rebels, you know, and they're all like, I ain't getting a shot. I ain't taking the vaccination. I ain't going to do this. I ain't going to do that. They weren't like that. I take that back. They were all saying, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. We don't know what's in it. We don't know if it works. We don't know if it hurts. We're not sure. Here's what I said. I could care less. I could care less. I'll go get 10 shots tomorrow. If God wants me protected, protected. If I'm wise, I'm wise. But I'm not getting it. Why not? Because you ain't going to make me. That's why. See, there's something in me. I don't care about the safety of it, the veracity of it. I'm not, even though, how could they rush it? Well, I'm getting, I'm not really getting off. Drugs, medicines, foods. That's where I was at without getting, going into that vaccination stuff. But luckily in Indiana, we got some freedom. You know, we're a blue state or red state, not a blue state. Um, thank the Lord for that. I, you know, I was against wearing a mask for a while. I still kind of am, but I still kind of not. I mean, if, they, if everything that medical, true, they've discovered any underlying health, that's me. I'm open heart surgery. Um, uh, my age, uh, it's a lung disease, so I worry about lungs. So I get a cough. I start, you know, if I'm coughing or I have a phlegm, I, I think to myself, I better watch out. I don't, I don't worry about it, but I'm not taking a vax. Because they got to make it. Now, this is getting a little bit off the point. Do you know what I think the mask and the vax is all about? The mark, baby. They're getting everybody to say, yeah, line up with that. Line up, line up, line up. Everybody line up. Line up for your vax shot. Got to get it. You're going to get COVID. You're going to get Omicron. You're going to get the monkey pox. You're going to get a variant. <laughs> I guess if God wants me to, I will. If I'm foolish, and people do get it. I mean, there, COVID is a bad thing, man. If it grabs hold of you, it can kill you. It almost killed Tony Richardson, a good friend of ours. I mean, it can kill you. But I'm not going to go through life worried. And I'm not going to let somebody, 
make me if I don't want to in my mind, unless, you know, I get tortured or something. Tell us, the Gestapo says, where's the French underground? Once they start chopping off fingers, maybe I'll talk, but I'm not just going to give in because they say, go get a shot. And I think that is controlling of the masses in preparation for the end time. Anybody that doesn't see that, it's okay. I mean, I would agree to disagree, but I'd be right and they'd be wrong. I mean that in a nice way. Sure. What else could it be? And the whole stinking world masked up. You got these people wearing a mask. You got these big visors and all. It's like, bro, Drew Wells, he doesn't even wear that much face covering. <laughs> hey, man. Like, man up, you women. No. So, 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 um, uh, in everything, give thanks. Don't be overtaken, the Bible says. If man be overtaken in a fall, okay, you're overtaken. The devil's pursuing you. The battle's for the mind. Okay, one more passage, and then we're going to close. I promise I'm going to read this passage, and then I'm going to let you go. Next week, I'm going to have more things written down, and, I, and I, we'll try and finish this out. I lost all my notes. I had a whole uh, folder like this. I had to cut that down. Make my notes here. But I had a whole folder with uh, probably 10 pages, 15 pages. I don't know where it went. thought it was upstairs in the classroom, but it's gone. So I started working on some other stuff. Like, for example, the mind. Number one, it's free will. Number two, um, uh, with our minds, we make decisions and choices. Number three, um, oh, whatever I have. Uh, man supposes, God disposes. Man plans, God laughs. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a football player or a cowboy. I never wanted to be a cop. I wanted to be a football player or a cowboy. I remember when I was four or five years old, I, it had to be because where we lived, I spaced my childhood from the house that we lived in. Uh, we moved a lot. Um, when I was four or five, we had this monster Webster dictionary. And I came in, I had some little piece of paper, and I was laying on the floor, and I was writing. My mom said, what are you doing? I said, I was going to copy the dictionary. I mean, this stuff is like, copy the dictionary. And I, she didn't say Copy the dictionary, son. You'll never be able to copy the dictionary if you live to be 100 years old. Copy, rather. You know, you'll never be able to do that. Even if, you, even if you live to be as old as Diane White, you will never. <laughs> Man, all right. <laughs> Don't they get funny? Come on, how many do they get funny? Come on, thank you, Miss Kate. Thank you. It's because it comes out like. What did he just say? What is, what is she saying? And she didn't say that. She wasn't discouraging. I, she, I don't remember her being positive, but I, I mean, I'm not going to say I remember what happened, you know, 60 years ago. But, but I knew she wasn't discouraging. Now, my mom didn't know. She probably said, that's good, honey. That's fine. Put it back when you're done or something. My mom didn't know, Joe, that I was going to give my, spend my whole life with books, right? At four or five years old. I mean, I'm a, a a bookophile, bibliophile, right? A bookophile, loves books, loves them. Um, read one now. I got all these books, Joe. You got to come to my house. I got more awesome books. If you like to read, I got awesome stuff. You'll, you'll love this stuff. Um, I'm reading one right now called um, Out of Africa, but The Search for David Livingston. Have you heard of Stanley and Livingston? Stanley said David, uh, Living, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Man, there's a great story, a backstory. I mean, I never knew anything about it. Anyway, Books. When I said I was going to copy dictionary, my mom wasn't negative. Um, she didn't know what I was going to write. What was I doing at four or five years old? I think. Now, what, what could I possibly been, what was going on there? And, and we don't recognize it, but you've got a great Bible teacher. Like, when I was four and five years old, I was already showing signs of my interests. Well, I was interested. None of my other brother, my brother was drawing. You know, my sister was playing, cooking, whatever she's doing when she's eight or nine years old. Uh, my brother, he was a great artist and everything. Uh, he, he, he still was a great artist. Um, me, I was into that, and, and I don't remember playing sports back then. I was too little, I guess, to go out by myself. But I, but I remember that. Well, what was going on? My mind was going somewhere. Taking my body somewhere. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay, uh, what I say? Mark 5, last scripture, we're done. Mark 5. Mark 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, um, 
And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, talking about Jesus, immediately there came out of the tombs. So it's kind of funny. They parked the ship and it was close to the tombs, I guess, close to a graveyard. Uh, they didn't really have graveyard like we have. They didn't bury them in the ground. They were all buried in tombs. Uh, a tombs of a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, so a dude lived in the graveyard, and no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Can you imagine that? Here they tried to bind this guy with chains. First they tried ropes and different things. And they tried chains. This guy could bust chains. Sounds like he's demon possessed. Because that he'd often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains didn't pluck the thunder by him. And the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, so neither could any man tame him. You know, they sent the psychologist. They sent the psychiatrist. They sent the priest out. They sent the pastor out. They sent his family out. They sent his uncle out. They sent grandpa. They sent everybody they could think of. They sent his Maybe his son, if he had a son or a daughter. Nobody could tame this guy, okay? Verse number uh, five. Always, night and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying. And by the way, if you're in a mountain and you have a, 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 your little town there, it's nestled in maybe like a little valley, or then some trails come together, and the mountain is spread by a stream, the water comes down, so you got a little mountain. When you're up on a mountain crying, Oh, ho, ho. I mean, this guy's demon possessed, crying and making noise. I guarantee you, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, at midnight, uh, the dog barked, and, and the wife said to husbands, Go shut that guy up. Can't anybody do anything? I mean, look, when we read our Bible, you got to see the picture. Again, well, I don't get anything out of it. Okay, I'll, I'll hold my tongue. The person says, I don't get anything out of it, doesn't read it. If you read this book every day, they tell you, I don't get anything out of Mark 5. I, I, I promise you, read it. Read it three times a day, every day for a week and tell me you don't get anything out of it. You'll be like, there's so much stuff in there. Okay, you got to see that. Why does the Bible say it was mountains? Why does the Bible say that? There has to be a reason. Okay, so he's making all this racket and he's disturbing everybody. Uh, cutting himself with stones, verse 6. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What do I do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God, uh, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God, thou torment me not, verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So this, this guy possessed with demons said, um, don't send me away. Why do, why do you think he didn't want to go away? Anybody know the story? Here, let's run down to verse 20 and I'll tell you. Verse 19. Look at verse 19, 519. Now we're skipping over where I want you to get to. Verse 19. So we're talking about um, why, did this, why did this devil, why did this man have enough of his mind even though he was uh, crying and breaking chains? I mean, this guy was stinking demon possessed. If there ever anybody was, this guy was. But he had enough of the mind yet that he said he knew who Jesus was. He said, what do I do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most God? Listen, I adjure thee by God, thou torment me not. He's saying, don't even come to me and talk to me about going out into the pit, going out into hell. It's not my time yet. Please don't do that to me. Don't torment me. Why? Because that devil knew, that was in this man, knew he was going to spend eternity in hell. But he didn't want to go yet. So it's not my time yet. Not until the end time. I'm Because I guarantee you, Satan has told all his if, and I wish we'd get in the Bible like I do. Satan had to talk with him. He had a meeting. It's a, it's a meeting. Okay, all you cats over here, all you gentlemen over here, all you fools over here, all you guys are messing up over here, all you guys are running Indian, Pakistan, all the time. Please, you don't think they do? Of course they do. He said to him, hey, what's going on around here, man? Why you guys fumbling the ball? Well, we're trying not to. And he says, hey, the game's getting close. We still, at this time, we still have 2,000 years. Book of Revelation's not yet. John has been, the apostle John has not been, and by the way, the disciples were already chosen by Jesus, and the devil would have said, that guy's not been exiled heaven. Why, don't you think the devil knows the Bible? The Bible's been done since heaven. So the devil knows the book of Revelation. So he's urging these imps and these demons on. They're attacking this guy by saying, hey, don't worry. So this devil says, not yet. And the Lord says, okay. Um, he says, uh, Come out of the man. He says, we're a legion. Verse 8, 10. And he besought him. The devil said to the Lord, uh, besought him, begged him much, that he would not send him away out of the country. Why? Verse 19 tells you why. 
Somebody tell me real quick. Hurry, we'll get out of here. Jesus was going to heal him, then what was he going to do? He spread the word. No, what was he going to do? Look at verse 19. What, was he, what did Jesus tell him to do? Where did Jesus tell him to go? Mm-hmm. Go home. This guy who was demon possessed, I think, at least this is my take, and it's fair, you know, we can interpret it any way you want to. I believe this guy, though he was demon possessed by a legion, had enough of the mind to say, why did he stay in the tombs? Why did he stay in the house? He stayed close to home. Because he knew, home, man, home. He said, don't cast me out. Don't send me away. And, uh, and Jesus said, uh, verse 19, we skip over it. But he besought him much. He wouldn't send him away. And he said, go home. Go home to your family. Go home to your friends. I love to tell this story. You met demon. In fact, look at verse 15. Let me skip over. said I'd get you out of here, but I'm not. Um, verse 15. And they came to Jesus and see that him that was possessed with the devil... And had the legion sitting and clothed and in his what? Two words right there? Right mind. right mind. Goodness. Okay, we better stop. Right mind. So that means the Lord can heal anybody. He can help anybody at any time. Not only that, it means there's a right mind. And then if there's a right mind, what other kind of mind is there? A wrong mind. Well, not wicked all the time. We're not talking about here wicked. We could, but a wrong mind. A wrong mind. So figure it out, man. Why am I right mind? That dude's not in his right mind, you know. What's the wrong mind? What's the wrong mind for Doug Jackson may not be the wrong mind for Angel Dominguez. What his besetting sin is could be 50 miles away from mine, but we all have them. So we want to lay aside the weight, lay aside the besetting sin. Now, I, I will tell you one weight. I'll pray we're done. One way you're going to carry is every day you don't take some time with the Bible. That's a weight you'll carry heavier that day. And, and I want to encourage you next week about Bible memory, about what did Spurgeon say about soaking his soul? What did he say? He'd rather what? Soak his soul in several chapters, a few verses and less than his hand in several Yeah, so it's not how much you read. Soak your soul in, soak your soul in those four verses. Write them down. Soak your soul. If you haven't been already, Corinthians 4.8, 1 Corinthians 10.5, Isaiah 26, 3, and then we'll pick that one up right there because that gets to the mind. The besetting sin, the besetting sin, the besetting sin. And, and, and the devil thinks he's got you. He thinks he's got me. He's been after me for 50 years in this thing. He thinks he's got me, but he doesn't because I'll keep fighting. I'll keep fighting. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for our time together. Uh, Bless these scriptures to our heart. Help us in the battle for our mind. In Christ's name, amen. All righty.